Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Um, uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my, my friends from the South and from other parts, if you're joining us from elsewhere. Uh, my name is Howard Singer, one of the Associate Directors of Undergraduate Admission. I'm happy to be able to be here and moderate this program for you. Uh, I want to first congratulate you on being admitted to Boston College in the single most challenging year that has ever been to be admitted to Boston College. Uh, it, it, you have a daunting task before you to try to choose where you think will be the best fit for you for the next four years of your life. Uh, and I have a terrific panel of six graduates from Boston College uh, to tell you a little bit about themselves and their experience. And then I welcome you to put uh, your questions into the Q&A and we will be going through them. Um, and I'll be posing them to, uh, to our panelists. We plan to go for about an hour and um, we just encourage you to ask anything that you think is gonna be relevant of our folks uh, that will help you to make up your mind if Boston College is gonna be the place that you might wanna have call your home. Um, so um, I'm gonna ask the panelists if you want to in al alphabetical order by first name to go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell them where you're from, you know, what you studied, maybe a little bit about your experience right now professionally. I think that's me. Hi, everyone. My name's Alyssa Biggins. I graduated BC in 2016 uh, from the Carroll School of Management with concentrations in finance and computer science. And now I currently live in Houston, Texas. Um, and I am a power and gas trader at Shell now. But prior to that, I worked at BlackRock in New York for two years. Um, and have been at Shell for about three this upcoming June. Great. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brianna Ware. I graduated from BC in 2011 uh, with a BA in English Literature and a, a Creative Writing concentration. Um, I then went to Harvard Law School where I graduated with a JD um, and then moved to Atlanta where I joined a law firm here and practiced construction litigation and international arbitration. Um, and now I'm actually in-house at Kennesaw State University, which is a university here, uh, and I'm excited to talk to you guys. All right, I need to do a quick double check that G comes, after, comes before J, not after, but um, I'm Greg Pigeon. I'm uh, Boston College class of 2011. I was part of the Carroll School of Management where I concentrated in finance and economics. Uh, I currently live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, moved to New York City after school in 2011, where I worked first for Morgan Stanley Wealth, Private Wealth Management as an analyst on a wealth management team there. Uh, and now I'm a financial advisor, run my own, uh, run my own team at Morgan Stanley um, and live in Brooklyn with my wife, who is also a 2011 grad. I will go. Hey guys, J.W. Carpenter, class of 2001 political science. Um, and then I went and got a law degree at Georgetown in 2006. Um, I practiced I practiced law for about four years, but I spent most of my career in the nonprofit uh, space first as a teacher with Teach for America. And now um, I recently took a new job at a new organization called Prosper Birmingham, which is focused on inclusive economic development in Birmingham, Alabama, and in our, in our general region, which is where I live. And I guess that leaves me. Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Robinson, also BC class of 2011 with Greg and Brianna. So it's great to see them and high school classmates with Greg. We're both from Phoenix. So representing the South there. Um, uh, so out of college, my career, we, we started a company called Drizzly, which uh, this, none of you students should, should know about, um, but we are a beer, wine and spirits, e-commerce and delivery platform. Um, and we're currently in the process of selling that business to Uber, which is really exciting and figuring out what's next. So um, yeah, good to meet y'all. Thank you all for those introductions. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, a couple of questions until we, we start to get uh, traction with our, our audience here. Uh, the very first one would be, please talk about the differences between 
your region, whether it's the Southeast or the Southwest, and what it was like coming to Boston for school. Uh, maybe talk about were there any adjustments, any difficulties that you had relative to climate, food, culture, uh, so that most of our audience will get a flavor for that. Sure, I'll you know I'll I'll jump in uh, real quick. Coming from like Justin said, I forgot my introduction. From Phoenix, Arizona, born and raised, 18 years there, uh, and love warm weather, love the sun, love playing golf. And so when I went to BC, quickly realized when it was snowing in October that uh, things were going to change a little bit. But um, what I like to tell people about you know the the change, and obviously I stayed in in New York, so um, you know have have come to really love the Northeast is. Uh, from a from a climate perspective, at least, being from Phoenix was being from the Southwest was was a pretty great um, kind of lure for for friends and stuff because you go like you get the fall it's really cool it's a really new experience and then uh, yeah it starts to snow in November December and you're kind of well this is fun and then you get into finals so you're just kind of you're stuck inside studying for finals anyway and then you go home for the holidays for a month and you're like. Oh, this is awesome. It's 70 degrees back home and everybody who lives in the Northeast, all my friends are freezing. Like maybe somebody wants to come visit me over the holidays and, you know, you go back and yeah, it's cold again, but the snow is fun. You're kind of tired of your parents. And then, you know, you go back for spring, you have a built-in spring break when you go home too. So, you know, Hey, why don't you guys, a couple of people want to come visit me in, in Phoenix for spring break. It'll be a lot of fun. So, you know, you kind of get used to the weather. You get used to that culturally speaking, things are a little different. Things are a little quicker. People are a little bit more, uh, people are a little bit more, uh, I won't say in your face might be the, the mean way to say it, but kind of more direct than maybe you're used to. But again, you kind of adapt, get used to it. And, and uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's, it's, a, it's just a change the way of life and you get to learn, uh, learn a lot about different people. And, and yeah, I would say, oh, sorry, go ahead, Alyssa. No, you go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, I think I said I'm from Georgia. Um, and so being from the Southeast, the two things that stood out most to me about how Boston was different was first, um, in terms of manners, I think I called someone ma'am pretty early and got chewed out <laughs> um, about that. So I had to adjust on that. And then also um, football, my first football game um, at BC. And I was there when Matt Ryan was there. And so we had a great team, but it was um, a very different experience from what I'd uh, grown up with in the SEC, but I quickly learned that, um, that Boston has many great sports, college and professional, especially. Uh, I grew to love hockey, um, which I knew nothing about outside of Mighty Ducks um, before going to Boston. So that was really cool to see it in person. Um, and so also the seasons were something that I, I didn't really anticipate, but having a true fall, very long winter, spring and summer um, was was really, really cool and something that I missed still. Alyssa, if you wanted to add something, please. Oh, sure, yeah. I was just going to say, adding on to the cultural aspect, I was very prepared to going into the Northeast, uh, thinking that everyone was going to be kind of, as Greg said, in your face and everything's a lot quicker and things in the South move a little bit slower. But I don't think that that was 100% the case just because I met people not only from the Northeast, but from all over the world because BC doesn't just attract people from the Northeast. So I think most of my friends at BC were actually from other states um, outside of the Northeast. So culturally, it was kind of cool getting to experience lots of different cultures and not just the North. Um, there was a, a question that just came in from a, a young man whom I actually have met. Uh, from Alabama, so maybe uh, JW, you might want to start with this, but I would welcome anyone. You wanted to know about what you hated to part ways with when it was time to leave Boston College. Well, first of all, hello, Christian. Congratulations on your acceptance to Boston College. This is one of our local Birmingham City School students, so I'm very proud of Mr. Hawkins. Um, so I would say um, there were a couple things for me. The first, I mean, the first, and, and I think this will be true of everyone to some degree. Um, I, I mean, it was very hard to leave my friends. Uh, you know, I ended up going to rural Arkansas, then back to DC, then back to Alabama. Most of my best friends are just spread all over the country. And that, uh, that is a tremendous professional benefit. 
Uh, but personally, like, I wish I saw them more. I wish I hung out with them more. And, you know, I, I think I'm proud to say we, we lived it up while we were there and we had a lot of fun, but it was very hard to leave them. I would say the second thing that was very hard to leave for me is I felt like at Boston College and, and you know, I am not Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I don't practice Catholicism. But I think what I what uh, is so inclusive about Boston College's campus, regardless of um, your faith experience, is that it is a very inspiring place. It's a place where the priests and, and the other folks on campus uh, are, are really trying to inspire you to just run through a wall, to, to try new things, to meet new people, uh, to go out there and be men and women for others. I think I like to think that spirit carried with me uh, in, in my life and my work, but I would say it was far easier uh, when it was bottled for four years on campus. And so those are the two things that I miss the most. Maybe one or two other perspectives, just to, you know, Justin or Alyssa, anyone want to join in on that? Yeah, for me, I mean, it was, um, it was just like the community of, of people that you're around every day and you take it for granted when you're there and it's four years of like being surrounded by your best friends that like challenge you and you have fun with and you, you know, play sports with whatever. And then you leave and and people go to different cities and everyone starts dispersing and so like yeah of all the things that i hated parting ways with it was being around my friends like 24 7 um but uh yeah that was a tough one um, another question came in about a similar vein how difficult was it to move in and to travel to boston college coming from someplace distant from campus the, the logistics i suppose Um, I can answer this one because I, I spent every summer um, back in Georgia, so I would travel back and forth um, every year. And it, it was actually relatively easy, um, especially freshman year. The, they do a really great job of you know, helping students get oriented, get moved in. Um, it's very well organized. Uh, you, you see basically your whole class at a couple different targets in the city. And so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Everyone's in the same boat, um, which I think, which I think is great in terms of travel. Um, my parents had a rule that I wasn't allowed to come home until Thanksgiving, my freshman year. Um, they came up for parents weekend. Uh, and then otherwise I had to stay in Boston. So um, I quickly got used to the city and like everyone's mentioned, you know, you make some great friends. Um, and so that was that was great. And you get to know people, I think, like Alyssa said, from all over the country. And so I, I had um, some great times traveling to visit different friends, families. Um, and so it was it was not difficult um, was my experience. And during the summer, if you want to store your stuff, um, there's lots of different services for that um, as well. So I, I found it a pretty straightforward thing um, and residence life, those folks were very helpful as well. Howard, just real quick, do they still do the last orientation um, move in weekend? Yes, in a yeah. non COVID environment, yes. Okay. So, so that was what I was gonna touch on. Coming from a non Northeastern state, what I took advantage of is the last, there's, there's six or seven orientations throughout the summer for freshmen. For students who don't come from the Northeast, I took advantage of this. You're allowed to do the last, only students from the outside of the Northeast are allowed to do the last orientation, which is the weekend before school starts. So you actually move, instead of just staying in a random dorm on campus for the other orientations, you move into your dorm. So I was able to come in a couple of days early, get everything set up. You know, I was, I was lucky that my, you know, my dad came with me. So we went over to like the Target in, uh, in uh, Watertown a, a few miles away to like do our early stuff, all that kind of stuff. So it, that was really helpful just coming a couple of days early, get a lay of the land, do orientation and that orientation being with um, all students who were coming from outside of the Northeast too. So kind of that same, you know, meeting new people, you know, the, the challenges or changes of, of coming to Boston from somewhere else. You already had this group of people who are like, all right, well, I know that person's from Florida. I know that person's from Texas. We can kind of commiserate together when it's uh, when it's cold coming in, in the winter. But that was definitely a great thing to take advantage of to, to move in. Thank you, Greg. And all of the students on this uh, 
on this Zoom uh, can go into their portal and they can see, they can go to freshman year experience, they can see about the orientation right now, the plan is to have sort of a hybrid model uh, that's, that will culminate with everyone getting to campus that last weekend. So uh, the beginning is expected to be virtual. Um, one other thing before we move on to the next question, uh, for those of you uh, in Brianna, you had mentioned this not uncommon that um, you're not just going to go home on a weekend, but for, when you don't go home, even potentially for Thanksgiving, uh, did you find that you were able to have friends locally and maybe spend a weekend or, you know, just take advantage of that and you know, have that experience? My freshman year roommate was from just outside of Boston. And when she found out that I was from Texas and wasn't going to be going home for Thanksgiving, it was like literally the second day of college. And she had invited me home for Thanksgiving already and we didn't even know each other. So I spent that first Thanksgiving uh, with her family. And it was really cool because I got to see their family's traditions. And also it's usually like 80 degrees in Texas during Thanksgiving. So it was kind of nice to have a true fall Thanksgiving and do some of those actual uh, cold weather traditions. And uh, something else, if we can switch over to the city of Boston, uh, one of the big selling points, I believe, of going to school uh, at a university if not in near the city. Can some of you talk about how you might have used it uh, as undergraduates, uh, what you used it for, either you know, professionally, academically, culturally, socially, that's just so people see the range of things and maybe how accessible is Boston to our students? I can jump in here. Um, coming from a, a city that had very little uh, public transportation outside of kind of the city center, I was really nervous and really excited about learning um, the T in Boston. Boston is super accessible. You can walk um, a lot of places. BC is at the end of the Green Line. Um, and so there's a very easy, there's a literal a subway stop like on campus right across from the main um, gate. And so it was really easy to get into and out of the city. I, I took advantage of it, especially socially, I would say. Um, I had friends at Northeastern, um, at some of the other colleges. And so it was really easy to get to get in and out. And I spent a lot of time trying to discover new places to eat um, in Boston. And there's a great food scene there, lots of great seafood and other food. And so I spent a lot of time going in um, to the city in which I had actually spent more. Yeah, we all the time would go in for like, it's cool to have multiple big um, professional sports teams uh, downtown and at the garden. It's super easy to get there on the tee. And I mean, with Uber these days, I guess, Alyssa, you're the only one that really got to experience that out of us, but that makes getting into the city much easier. So it's, but you're right next to like, you know, such a thriving, amazing city with so many students in it that, um, but, but you're, you're, you're like, you're not like right in the city center. So you still have this campus feel. So the combination of being like right next to this amazing, like bustling city where I still live today, like 12 years later, um, you know, but having your campus feel as well, like you can't get a better combination than that. I don't think than at BC. So. One of my classes also incorporated going into the city. It was a class I took my sophomore year called Pulse that incorporated philosophy, theology, and volunteering. And twice a week, a group of five people, including myself, would take the tea to Chinatown, um, like at four o'clock or something, and go teach uh, uh, English to kids in that neighborhood. So we got to, I had never been to a Chinatown in any city prior to doing that. So it was really neat to explore that area, get to know local people in that area, and also be able to do something for the wider community of Boston um, while getting class credit for that, which was really neat. So there's tons of ways to get into the city. Thank you. Um, a, a question came in and um, somewhat specific, but, uh, and I'm gonna expand this for all of you. How strong is the job placement in networking in the South? And um, 
so if some of you have had experience with that, but can you also maybe have uh, someone else speak about the alumni network overall and the advantages of that, uh, not just in the South, but nationwide, because so many of you have had experiences not exclusive to where you grew up. So I'll just, I'll speak to this. I'm not a school of uh, management uh, graduate, so I'll let those folks address that piece of it. Um, what I would say is, is that, you know, uh, if you're in Birmingham or in Alabama, you know, our most prominent Boston College alum is Bruce Pearl, who's the coach of Auburn. You know, I used to be kind of near the top before he came in and just big footed me. It's really frustrating. Um, but what I'd say is like, there are certain places where the Boston College specific network isn't going to be as large as say in New England or probably on the coasts or in major cities. But I think the name just rings out when people see that I went to Boston College or went to Boston College, you know, maybe they went to a Jesuit school, which is everywhere. So they know about Boston College. They certainly know Boston College uh, from sports. Uh, they know Boston College uh, having a really good reputation. So even if you don't necessarily have that network, but uh, you're, you're going to have that reputation, which is incredibly helpful. And then every once in a while, you're going to meet someone who went to Boston College or uh, their kids went to Boston College. And while that's a maybe, you know, your, your network is bigger in Boston, if you meet someone in Birmingham who has a tie to Boston College, like you have friends for life. So it's a very deep, deep uh, relationship in Birmingham or in Alabama or the South, even if the network isn't quite as broad. Yeah, so I had mentioned earlier, I started my career out in New York and about two years into my first job, I decided I couldn't stick it out like Greg and needed to move back closer to home. And so I literally Googled largest employers in Texas and started applying to like random jobs. Uh, that I felt I was somewhat qualified for. And I made it through like three different phone interviews at Shell uh, to work in their on the trade floor. And my in-person interview, my very, it was four different rounds of different people. And my first uh, in-person interview, the guy sitting across the desk from me just happened to be a BC alum. And we hit it off immediately. And he was like, wow, it's crazy that you were like in Houston and are applying for this job. And I happen to be interviewing you. And so the interview just started off on such a high. So when I got through other interviewers, I, even if I didn't necessarily know the answers or wasn't super confident in what they were asking necessarily, I had started out so high and had that initial bond that I felt really good going through it and ended up getting the offer and have been there three years now. And while that guy is not my manager and uh, we're not even on the same team, we actually pre-COVID did quarterly lunches where he we would go out and talk about different BC traditions and talk about what's going on in our personal lives and all of that. So you kind of never know where you're gonna meet them. And when you do, uh, like JW said, it's pretty awesome because they're not necessarily as prominent as it is in Boston. Yeah, and then I'll just you know jump in from a, again. I stayed in New York, so so going to the South this this will uh, won't be as as tied in there, but just about the alumni network in general. Um, to me, it was a lifesaver. So my junior year, after my junior year, I went and uh, got an internship with the NBA, which was awesome, the National Basketball Association. There were, um, I think, 25 of us. There was one school that was represented by two by two interns, and that was BC. So that was that was pretty cool. We had we at least had two of us compared to everybody else had one. But um, my this is kind of specific, but my senior year was if you're a basketball fan, and you guys honestly might be too young to remember this, which is kind of scary. But the last time the NBA had a work stoppage, they called a lockout, and that was my senior year. So I was all set to go back. Didn't really do any resume prep, anything like that. I was, I had a job, and when they, when they locked out, when they had this work stoppage, they canceled all their um, post grad programs. So I was without a job, hadn't done any, like hadn't done all the interview stuff, hadn't gone through the whole regular thing, and uh, I sat down with um, a professor who's still there. She's one of the the deans in the the school of management, Amy Donigan. 
And she sat down with me and just said, don't worry, we're going to figure this out. So we went line by line through my resume, redid my entire resume. We kind of went through not just, look, you're hearing all these different things of what you should do. People are, and what was great from an alumni network standpoint was I told that to a few people and I had phone calls with a dozen different people in the next couple of weeks of, hey, listen to what I do, listen to what I do. And, and her thing was just find something that clicks and we'll figure it out. And so uh, it was amazing. She was awesome. The career center there in terms of interview prep, mock interviews, resume uh, was great. And I got my first job. I, I owe my entire career to the fact that um, I was a BC grad because the guy who hired me, his kids went to BC and he only hired BC kids. So hired one kid every year always was a BC kid. I got that job, worked for him for three and a half years. And it was basically an apprenticeship to what I do now. And, and um, so without him, without that connection, um, I wouldn't be where I am today. So the, the career network and the alumni network is amazing. A lot of my clients now as a financial advisor are BC grads because um, a lot of what I do is, is not necessarily cold calling, but reaching out to people. Hey, do you need help? Hey, do you need help? 90% of those people don't respond. If it's a BC grad that I reach out to, it's usually like 50, 60% of at least, hey, go Eagles, you know, uh, and uh, it's, it's really a benefit both in terms of that early period where I was at and still today, it's, it's a huge benefit to what I did. Well, uh, Alyssa gave, gave us the perfect segue for this next question. And uh, so let, let's put the fun into this now, really really fun. Um, and I want each of you to answer this. And you can, if you want, you can go in the alphabetical order so you don't step on each other. But uh, some folks want to know, what's your favorite tradition? And, um, and, and have a couple backing up if you don't go first so that someone else doesn't steal yours and you have nothing left to say. So one of my favorite traditions is probably uh, not necessarily the normal one that someone would give the answer to um, is called the red bandana run. So in, I assume it didn't, actually, I know it didn't happen this year uh, because of COVID, but there was a virtual one. So for those of you not familiar with the red bandana uh, story at BC, there was a BC alum, uh, Wells Remy Crowther, who died in 9-11 because he was working in the Twin Towers and uh, his dad had been a firefighter. So growing up, he'd been trained um, in, I guess, basic saving people and was taught always to carry a red bandana with him. And so as he was able to get out of the towers, but ran back in when the towers were still crumbling and people were stuck inside. And he uh, ended up saving uh, at least four accounts that have come forward saying this man in the red bandana saved him. Um, and he unfortunately passed away during that while trying to save more people, but in memory of him and his uh, great heroic efforts, we celebrate him both at a football game every year where his parents come and we honor them, but also in donate, um, fundraising and donating money to different charities every year uh, in his name through a 5K that's held on campus. So it's not the most exciting thing to wake up at 7 a.m. on a Saturday when you're in college, but the amount of BC students and people in the surrounding area that come together for this, a couple of years I did it, there were thousands and thousands of people and people just run with their friends or walk or do it just because it's part of something bigger than yourself. And um, it's usually in September, so the weather's not too cold yet either, but that's one of my favorite traditions. Um, I'll say two, but I'll say them quickly. So one um, is the Ahana Leadership Council holds an annual showdown every year. And so that's when all the dance teams on campus um, get to perform and compete for the grand prize. I was on the um, all-female step team in college, which is where I met some of my best friends. And so we competed um, and that was always really fun every year because you get to really not only um, show your friends what you've been working really hard on, but also get to see all of the other um, teams on campus. And it's a lot of fun. It's held in Conti or used to be, I'm not sure if it's still held there. Um, and so that was really fun. And the second one is uh, the senior sunrise. So for senior week, um, there's, I guess it's the day of graduation, the day before graduation, everyone stays up 
late um, until the sunrise. And so it's just a really special moment and time with um, your friends, the other seniors. And it's something that I always think about fondly. Um, we were all delirious with um, sleepiness, um, but it was just a really special memory. So I always look back at that um, and I'm really grateful for it. Brianna, before we go on to Greg, I don't know if you stole his, but I'm, I'm gonna stall and give him another 20 or 30 seconds to think. Would you just explain to everyone watching what, what is a HANA you would refer to? Sure. So a HANA is the term that um, BC uses for minority students. So it's African-American, Hispanic, Asian, Native American um, students. And so a HANA is the name that, that encompasses all of those groups. And so it's used for a lot of different things on campus. So you have, for example, the undergraduate um, government of Boston College, UGBC, which Justin and I did together. Um, but then there's also uh, the Ahana Leadership Council, which is really focused on um, specifically issues on campus that are related to um, people in those, those different groups that I just named um, and creating special programming and different events for them as well. And they work with UGBC, um, but they have a lot of different organizations on campus. And it's just really a way, kind of the umbrella term, um, but it's also very much a, a culture and a special thing um, at BC where all of those groups can come together um, and, and make sure that their voices are being heard on campus. Thank you. Greg. Brianna, you did steal mine. I was I was gonna go with the senior sunrise also. All right. Uh, that's okay. There's 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 a ton of awesome traditions at BC. So um I'll go with Marathon Monday. Um and and I might as just sorry, Justin. I I know there's other ones that, that you love too, but uh Marathon Monday is um is just a blast. So the Boston Marathon is run uh on uh, in mid-April on a Monday and it's a local holiday. So it's, it's called Patriots Day in Boston. And BC is one of the final miles. Uh, it's, and BC, if, you've, if you haven't visited yet, um, <laughs> you'll, you'll uh, a lot of people just comment about how much walking you have to do, how much stairs you have to do, because BC sits on top of a hill. So that mile coming up to BC is straight uphill and it's called Heartbreak Hill. So once you get to the top of Heartbreak Hill is Boston College. And so what runners say is, I'm not a runner. I think the farthest I've run is about a mile and a half. But, uh, but what, what my friends who did run it say is you, you're like dying. You've got five miles left. You get to the top of that hill and you see thousands, thousands of students going absolutely nuts. And people travel in from other parts of Boston to go to, B, to, go to BC because it's such a wild party. Um, everybody just has a blast. We get the day off of school on a Monday in the middle of April. So like you're kind of long slog through second semester, you know, you have finals coming up. So you get this random day off just to let loose and have fun. People are up kind of six, seven in the morning, already, already lined out on the streets. Uh, and it's just a great time. It's a lot of passion. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. And, and so many students, I think probably 30 to 50 students run it every year. And that, that number might be low. So you get to, you know, and your friends are training for, for weeks, if not months beforehand or months beforehand, um, to uh to train for the marathon so you know all your friends who are running it so you're you're looking out for them people write their names on their shirts so you can cheer for them and it's it's just a blast it's a it's a really cool day and and super specific to you know the boston area schools because there's no other place like it i thought justin had just quit it's like he's running out of answers just turn the screen off uh, marathon monday was going to be mine so um I guess I will say uh, probably the super fan shirts. Um, I think that started more or less around when I was there. Uh, is that correct? I think 9701, something like that. And so it's just yellow shirts. Everybody wears them at the games. Um, I, I, it, it's, it's terrific. I think I still have one. It is threadbare at this point, uh, but it's, it's hanging on. And I think it's a nice, uh, it's a nice thing when you go to the games, but it's just a nice reminder um, of your time at Boston College. I always love uh, seeing it. And I would give it to one of my children, except it would be destroyed within seconds. Yeah, mine was also definitely going to be Marathon Monday. Um, but I'll go with two. So one, um, the bean pot, which is like a, a very unique uh, Boston thing as well. And it's specifically Boston hockey. Like I didn't know this event existed, but it's BC, BU, Northeastern and Harvard all play in a hockey tournament against each other in like February in TD Garden. So everyone goes down into the city and it's like this, you know, really cool um, 
sporting event, you know, amongst like Boston uh, universities that are all like pretty good at hockey. So it's, that's a ton of fun. Then the other one real quick is um, mod stock, which is a concert on like the last day of school, I guess, last week of school. And it's outside in the mod lot, which is on lower campus. Um, and it's just like a celebration of the end of the year and we get cool art, you know, really fun artists every year. Um, so that that's probably number two. And just to follow up for this, the folks who might end up being first year students at Boston College, uh, if things go as planned, you might be the very first class ever to be able to watch two Boston marathons potentially in one year because they've postponed uh, the one from this April, which would be next week, to October. And then if things go as well as they should, um, you might be able to see it again. And for those of you who know about the tradition that the, the Boston Red Sox play a baseball game on that same day, Patriots Day, um, in, in honor of the Boston Marathon and the tradition, uh, they will not be wearing any red. They'll be wearing the colors of the Boston Marathon for that weekend, which is yellow and blue. So it's kind of an interesting uh, new tradition potentially. Um, earlier, JW had referenced uh, that word Jesuit uh, in one of his answers. So I wonder if several of you can talk a little bit about Boston College as a Jesuit Catholic university and how that may have informed or shaped your experience and, and continues to do so in your post-collegiate uh, profession in life. I'll kick off because, oh, sorry, Brianna, if you want to go, you can go. For no, go. Okay. Um, so yeah, someone, uh, uh, frankly, also not Catholic. Um, but what I loved about the, like the Jesuit way of being was the persistent curiosity and like the sort of encouragement for folks to have discussion and to have discussion with your professors and to have discussion with your classmates like there's probably very few other um, and maybe not but just from my friends that went to other colleges like I think that we actually like we talked about as roommates and as classmates like faith and spirituality I think like frankly much more than any other friends that I knew in college and that was an incredibly like healthy and really cool thing about what the Jesuit experience um sort of lends itself to so just awesome like uh, in encouraging curiosity, um, and really in encouraging conversation and dialect, but in like a really, you know, like, I don't know, like delightful way, if you will, that just got everyone talking. So, um, that's what it did for me. And then obviously the customer service or customer, the, uh, community service aspect of, of the Jesuit way too, was, it was a big, big thing for all of us, I think. Yeah, that, that kind of ties into what, what I was going to say, um, which is that I think part of the Jesuit kind of ideal and approach to education is the care of the whole person. Um, and so it was really important that they weren't just trying to educate you academically, although you do get a, a great education academically, but also trying to help you develop um, as a person spiritually, but also emotionally, just on every level. Um, and the way that that's been, I think, particularly impactful for me is that it really um, gave me an appreciation and an understanding of the importance of empathy um, in not just in interpersonal interactions, but in everything um, in my professional life, just having the understanding that the person on the other side of the screen, of the court, of whatever it was, is a person. Um, and that even though they may have a different background, religiously, racially, whatever it is, um, that they're still, you know, in the Jesuit kind of sentiment, they're a child of God and someone who's worth knowing and understanding. And that's been really impactful. And I'll put in a, just a quick plug for the retreats at Boston College. Um, campus ministry does just some incredible retreats on campus. Kairos is one, um, halftime is another. Um, and they're not all religiously focused. So there's 48 hours, for example, um, for freshmen, where it's just a weekend away, that time to reflect, to get to talk about you know the challenges and the great parts of freshman year, to get to know other people. Um, there's halftime which is a vocational retreat that starts getting you to ask those questions about what brings you joy does the world need you to do it 
are you good at it to kind of help direct your um, career paths. So there, there are just some really great opportunities for reflection and empathy um, at BC that I think is the result of the Jesuit education. And I, I'm really, really grateful that I had that. So I think both of those answers were just terrific. Um, I will just tell you that the Boston College and the Jesuits changed my life. Uh, I've probably overstated over the years, and I'm sure other people have, like, well, this changed my life. I will just say this. I, I don't take this back. I said what I said. Boston College changed my life. Um, I think that, but there are a lot of really great schools, and, and likely you guys are choosing from among a lot of really great schools. I think the thing that I've seen that sets Boston College apart uh, and I'd echo Justin's answer and, and Brianna's answers as well. I, I think that Boston College spikes in service. You know, if you go to Boston College at some point during your four years, you're going to volunteer. You're going to do some sort of service. And some people will go all in on that. Some people will just do it for a day here and there. But I think it changes your life. The message I got from the Jesuits very clearly was this is not for you. It's for the world. What is the point of your education? So what? And you need to go out there and be somebody. And they will challenge you and they will challenge your mind and they will push you. And that is good for you. As frustrating as it is, it is good for you. It is good to go somewhere new. It is good to meet new people. It is good to have new experiences. It is good to be uncomfortable. Uh, and I will say as a six foot tall, straight white male from a high income background, I don't have to be uncomfortable. I don't want to. And it was good to be uncomfortable. It made me a better, more joyful person. And so when I, that's the reason I did teach for America. And then when I went to law school and was a rich lawyer for four years, which was just outstanding and I really liked it and had the opportunity to go run Teach for America and launch Teach for America in Alabama, I felt the Jesuits in my ear. I felt them in my head. It's like, what are you doing? What is the point of you? What was the point of these four years? And that's what I did it. And I went to another nonprofit that supported kids in the city schools, great kids like Christian, who you heard here. And then, you know, 40 days ago, I took a new job to try and help with inclusive economic growth, helping startups, helping small businesses, making sure that Birmingham and our regional growth is for everyone and not just for folks kind of look like me. And I would say I would be, I would have made zero of those choices without the Jesuits. Uh, as annoying as it was to be challenged and pushed and told that I really didn't know everything at 20, which was super frustrating because I was confident I did. Um, it turned out that was really good, really good lesson in humility. Uh, and a really good lesson in what you can do with a Boston College education. And you don't have to do what I did. Uh, you see on this call, people are making lots of different choices and having a great impact. Uh, but I would say that if you go to Boston College, uh, you are going to be pushed and you are going to grow as a person. And, and that discomfort will lead you to really good decisions. And uh, without my Boston College education, uh, I would have made really different choices and I think worse choices. And I, I don't want to I don't want to step over that JW because that was that was pretty awesome. Um, but I you know I just wanted to add a, a couple of things in that uh, I am Catholic. I grew up Catholic, and um, being at BC was really great um, as Jesuits and Catholics because uh, the Jesuits there is a little twist I guess on Catholicism of that pushing of that challenging. You know I had I had conversations with priests of Are you sure you're Catholic? Are you sure you you know this is what you think and it's okay to have those conversations at the same time I definitely grew um you know my faith I don't think changed but at a time when you're 19 20 21 years old and going to church isn't you know that's not cool it's not fun uh when you're that age you know I still had a good group of friends where I was I didn't go to mass at all my freshman you know first few weeks of sophomore year and kind of met a group of people who went to a Sunday night mass every that was in one of the dining halls every uh, every week at 10 15 and it was this awesome way just to kind of decompress at the end of the week do something that would have been a tradition in my life for for years that just had kind of fallen away from uh, and it was a really great way to kind of have that that you know BC is a Catholic institution. So if you're a Catholic, it's not, it's not like you're going to avoid that or they're going to talk you out of being a Catholic by the end of your four years. Um, but that was a great kind of memory that I have of BC. And like I said, I'm definitely afterwards was a stronger Catholic because of those challenges like JW and Justin and Brianna all talked about. I came out of those challenges saying, yeah, I, you know, I really like this stuff. I, this is a part of me. And I had plenty of friends who came out of it and saying, you know, I don't really think so. And it wasn't a right or wrong answer. I don't think the priests that I, you know, the priests were happy that those people left, you know, left the, left the church. But at the same time, I think they were happy and confident that those people knew who they were rather than it was tradition and what they grew up doing and what they'd always done. So it was great for me. It was great for those other people who had different experiences too. Um, 
Thank you all. Uh, terrific way of uh, distinguishing Boston College from other really fine institutions that our registrants are, are likely considering. Um, Jaden has a question. So many of you have gone on to get a professional degree. Could uh, you talk a little bit about how Boston College helped to prepare you for moving on to uh, a graduate program through the application. And, and I wanna add something else that maybe one or two of you might be able to also furnish our audience. Um, relationships with professors. I mean, do you feel like you've had mentors and are there folks that you might still maintain a relationship with? Uh, I can start. I think someone mentioned the Career Center before. Um, there was a woman at the Career Center while I was there. She was since retired, um, but she was really instrumental during my, my law school application process. Um, she helped get me in contact with other BC alum um, who were attorneys just to help to kind of talk me through the process um, to give me some, some tips and to help with my personal statement. Um, BC was great. I mean, there are a lot of people who were applying for grad school senior year, um, and there are just so many different resources on campus. There were, you know, different offices where you could take, you know, your essays that they would help you. Um, the Career Center, like I said, getting you connected with alums at schools that you might be interested in just to talk through their experience. Um, but also, I think that BC just really prepares you for the rigor of graduate school, no matter if it's law school or anything else. Um, I felt really confident going into law school that I knew how to study, um, that I knew how to approach tests, that I could do it, that I could compete with my classmates. Um, because although BC is a very collegial place, the people who are there, they are excellent. Um, they are really smart, like all of you are who've been admitted. Um, and so you get used to working hard, you get used to being around other people who persevere. Um, and so I think that's really, really useful for graduate school and especially for your first year of law school, um, for those of you who are interested in that. So in the low point of his professional career, Howard Singer uh, admitted me to Boston College and we have maintained a very good friendship um, uh, uh, over the years and especially when he comes to town. Working in the admissions office was terrific. And I remember when I was applying to law school, certainly like having Boston College on the resume was very helpful. Uh, so was Teach for America. And I wouldn't have gotten into Teach for America except for going to Boston College. So um, there was a multiplier effect there. The other thing is I worked for a, a priest named Father John Paris when I was there is very important to me. And when I was choosing among law school admissions, I'd gotten into Georgetown and I'd gotten into a few different places and, and I hadn't got and, and I hadn't heard from Boston College yet. And he said, listen, go somewhere new, try something different. You had the Boston College experience, try something different. And I had like a bit of an ego uh, then kind of still do, but really had one then. And George kind of rejected me undergrad. So I had a little ego about that. And he's like, listen, don't let that get in your way. You know, consider the schools that you really need to go to. And I needed to hear that, you know, uh, at that time in my life. And it was very helpful to have mentors like that and certainly relationships with folks uh, like Howard that I, I, I gained in the admissions office. And then the last thing I'd say, and Howard did not ask me to say this, these folks in the admissions office, oh my, the amount of work and care they put into applications, I, I have never seen in any job I've ever been, I've never seen anyone rise above the duty of care they have and the work that they do. It's just really remarkable. I didn't go to professional school, but I can touch on the professor aspect to the question. And I'll just give a brief-ish example of one professor I had my sophomore year I had gone into college thinking I was going to be a finance and accounting major in the School of Management. And I had a, um, my academic advisor was like, why don't you try a management information course? And I was like, ah, tech, I'm not so good at, but sure, I'll push myself, I'll try this. And so I signed up for this like visual basic course essentially. And after the first day of class, I was like, cool. This is definitely not for me. I'm gonna go talk with the professor and tell him I'm dropping this class. There were only like 10 students in the class. So I, you can drop the class without talking to the professor but it was so small and intimate. I didn't wanna seem rude. So after class, I went to this professor's office hours and I was like, hey, thanks so much. This is really cool, but way over my head. 
I'm not gonna be able to do this. And he was like, well, why don't we like stick this out for a few weeks? You have a little bit of time and drop ad before you have to drop this class if you still don't like it and we can't and don't get it, go ahead and drop it. So I went to his office hours twice a week and we like basically relearned every lecture for three weeks and with a ton of work and effort and this professor's help, I was like, all right, I'll stick this out. You've been really kind. And by the end of that course, I had decided that I was going to drop the accounting portion of what I thought I was gonna be majoring in and decided that computer science was something I was actually interested in and went ahead and concentrated in that. And I don't really know any other place where a professor would sit with one student multiple times a week for many hours, essentially reteaching an entire lesson uh, just to show how passionate he was and try and teach you um, and because he's there to give back. So that was a really great um, professor that I had. Thank you. Um, Devin had a question, sort of uh, getting back to something that Brianna, you had mentioned about, uh, with, she wants to know, is there any, anything else shocking about going to Boston from the South? You know, you had mentioned, you know, the MAM aspect, you know, and, you know, over into my fourth decade of doing this, you know, I'm still getting used to when I go down to Alabama and, you know, Louisiana, people calling me Mr. Howard, you know, it's uh, just, but um, anyone else have anything that just sticks out with you since you've graduated about, gee, that's, that's different. They talk funny up there. The Boston accent is quite strange and definitely takes some getting used to, especially on the T when you're trying to listen to the conductor. They're like, I have no idea what they just said. Um, but uh, in seriousness, overall, there really wasn't anything that was like that culturally shocking. Um, I, people do talk a lot faster and I did have to really concentrate on listening to people, especially professors that were from that area, uh, just because honestly, like the accent and the speed is much faster than it is in the South. Yeah, I would say like the really quickly, the, uh, like the, to some extent, the, the like bluntness was like refreshing. Like it, like it, there was not, you know, people didn't really mince words. They tell you how they feel. And I like loved that and appreciated that coming from, from Phoenix. The other thing is that the roads, when we first got there, my mother, who's right here, she's going to love that I'm doing this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when we first landed, she's like, Oh my gosh, these roads are crazy. Cause they just, they're nonsensical. Cause it's such an old city. And the, uh, especially downtown, like there, there's no grids, you know, it's all like a complete mess and Boston drivers know what they're doing. And when you're from the South, you don't know what you're doing up there. So that was definitely a shock as well for her, not me. Well, it, as a native Bostonian, I'm both full of pride listening to what you're saying and deeply embarrassed for, for my own culture. Um, maybe one, one last exit question. Uh, can each of you give a bit of advice? You know, one of those, what would you say to students now about making the decision or the old, if you knew then what you know now about the, you know, with all your experience, um, any parting words that you would give to all the families that are watching? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. And just to piggyback off of, of that answer, there's an, if you Google, there's an awesome map of just an overhead picture of Boston roads and you look at it and it's bizarre. And there's also some side-by-sides of, look, this is a perfect grid. It makes sense. And hey, Boston, well, for uh, not so nice words about uh, what you should do when you're looking at it because it's just impossible. But uh, in terms of, you know, just advice for you guys making this decision, I think um, I'm sure I was under the same kind of stress, same, you know, how am I going to make this decision? What am I going to do? Um, but when I talk to, to students now, it, it seems like that has just gotten ramped up more and more. Maybe I just am far enough away from it now that it doesn't seem like I, 
I was thinking that that same way, but I would say you got into BC, you probably have better grades than, than we all did when we got in better SAT scores than we did when we all got in. Cause it's just gotten harder and harder. You're probably looking at awesome schools with great opportunities. Um, you know, JW, I, you know, I thought that was great in terms of, you know, how BC really did change your life. At the same time, I look back at the other schools that I was choosing from, you know, namely uh, Southern California and uh, a, a couple other schools like that and University of Miami where I could have gone and had sunshine and warmth and people who smiled all the time and it would have been totally different and weird. Um, you know, BC was perfect for me. And at some point I came to the realization that I was gonna feel really comfortable, really comfortable there. I would think for most of you, there's there's something in, inside you saying that this is where I'm supposed to be. I also feel pretty confident that if I had gone to one of those other schools, I wouldn't have had a miserable time, right? I wouldn't have had a miserable time in Southern California with great sports teams and an awesome campus and really great academics or, you know, outside of Miami with a great campus and great weather and, you know, great sports teams, all the kind of stuff that I was looking for. I think I would have turned out okay. I would have turned out different and I wouldn't trade my BC experience for anything, but you're probably looking at great schools, you know, as much as you can. I think my advice in terms of what I would do is try to take the pressure off a little bit because you're probably going to have a great experience no matter where you go. The reason I chose BC was uh, everybody I talked to just seemed, when, it, when they told me about their BC experience, it just seemed a little different. It got me a little bit more excited than the people who I talked to about the other schools. Again, that doesn't mean I would have had a terrible experience at those schools or I would, have, I would have been a terrible person if I had gone there. I'm sure I would have had a great time, but just something clicked for me and it felt right. And as much as that isn't a, a, this is how you should choose, it worked. And I, you know, hopefully I, you guys are going through the same thing and kind of have the same feeling one way or another, whether it's BC or not. I would just echo that. Um, you know, again, congratulations to all of you guys, and, and you really cannot make um, a, a poor choice, I don't think, when it comes to colleges. You've all got into great schools. Um, the reason why I chose Boston College was because it really, it felt like kind of the Goldilocks thing where I was looking at schools that were, I thought, way too big or way too small, and BC just always seemed to kind of hit exactly the middle mark um, of what I wanted, and it was a place, I heard someone say this maybe my freshman year, that you know, you, there's, you always see someone you know, but there's always someone new to meet. Um, and that was very much my experience at BC, um, that there were just so many great people to meet and that are still my, my very best friends that I feel really lucky to know. Um, but the other thing I would tell you in terms of advice to kind of let the pressure off is that um, these next four years are going to be incredible. You'll have challenges, you'll have triumphs. It'll be some of the most joyful um, experiences that you've ever had, but it also doesn't have to be the four best years of your life. I think it's going to be a great time, but I, I remember just feeling so much pressure about college is the best four years of my life, and I have to make sure that it's amazing every day. Um, and again, I had a really great experience at, at BC, but really your life only gets better. Um, every year I, in my experience. And so I would just say you've all gone through a really difficult and challenging year um, in many ways. And so you already know that you are um, incredibly strong and that you can per persevere. Um, and so just hold on to that and that you'll learn more about who you are um, and that you're going to do great. It's going to be great um, and just go to BC. But even if you don't, congratulations and it'll be, it, it's going to be great. I can't do better than those two answers. Just listen to them. I was literally, literally going to say the same. Yeah. We're, we're at time and like, those were extremely eloquent. Um, and yeah, y'all have a really difficult choice ahead of you, but you know, I think all of us obviously can confidently say BC was for me the best choice I ever made. Um, like no question about it, but um, good luck to all y'all. And again, congrats on getting in. Yeah, you guys have done the hard part. Now you just have to go with your gut, have fun, and congratulations. Well, wonderful words of advice, including uh, those who echoed the words of advice and those that came before them. Nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, before we wrap up, I want to uh, once again congratulate everybody uh, and let the students know that we continue to do amazing programs for you like this 
throughout the month of April. You can go into your portal and you can sign up for innumerable interesting programs that would feature deans and faculty and student groups and cultural organizations. Almost anything that you want to learn about, you can do so. Uh, we're sending out weekly emails to all admitted students that give you an update, but you, go, you can go and find out all those things right now and sign up for as many as, as you think interest you. Um, Howard, real quick, sorry, I just want to jump back in and, and say one more thing in terms of that advice. Do your, if you choose BC and don't have a great first couple of months, try to stick with it. Um, I was fortunate. I loved BC when I got there. Um, my brother actually went to BC and had a terrible first semester, felt like he was in the wrong place, felt like Boston was too different from where he came from. And now if you ask him about Boston College, you'll get three and a half hours of why Boston College is the perfect place for you and why you should be there and every single thing that you should do while you're there. So, and I had plenty of friends who had similar situations where they stuck it out, they got through it and, and loved it, especially coming from different places where it does seem kind of strange. Great, thanks. That's an important perspective. Uh, Greg, we appreciate you adding that. Uh, so you, we hope you all stay safe. Uh, we know this has been a highly challenging year, and for some of you, um, families traditionally like to visit schools at uh, the end of junior year when there wasn't much happening in schools and then into the senior year. And so you might be in the position of making a choice without actually visiting the school. And that's why we have such extensive programming, but we are doing tours, actual tours, just for admitted students, uh, very responsibly, very small tours. So, uh, and because they're small, they're capped uh, at about 20, um, which is typically one student and one parent. Um, you, you would, if you wanted, do that, you need to go in and register for those uh, and they fill up very fast. So I would encourage you, for those of you who don't want to make a decision without seeing the campus, this is the opportunity to do so. So everybody, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. I appreciate uh, the enduring relationship uh, that you have with Boston College and with, with those of us in admission. And I wish everybody a good night. Thank you. <laughs>